few words about Bill Riley, who I am told has something to do with this evening. Um, to use the words Riley and leader in the same sentence is about as perfect a match as can be found in the English language. Most of us are aware of his major contributions to US and global environmental policy through service at the World Wildlife Fund, as EPA administrator in the investment community, and as an advisor and catalyst for so many organizations and causes. And Tracy will have more to say about that. What has impressed us, though, as we talk to people in building this program is the tremendous personal regard and affection they have for Bill Riley and the influence he has had on their lives and careers. If our students are looking for an example of thoughtful, purposeful, gracious, and ethical leadership, they need look no further than our guest of honor tonight. Thank you, Bill Riley, for all you are doing for our university and our students. And we are really happy to have Senator Bob Graham with us tonight as our featured speaker. Senator Graham, of course, has a very impressive career in public service. His status as an environmental leader is unquestioned. In naming him as the co-chair of the National Oil Spill Commission in May of 2010, President Obama said that Senator Graham had earned a reputation as a champion of the environment, leading the most extensive environmental protection effort in the state's history, the state of Florida. So thank you, Senator Graham, for joining us, and we look forward to your remarks. I'd want to take a minute to say a few things about the Center for Environmental Policy and its mission. Our focus is on improving environmental governance in the United States and elsewhere if we can. We seek to forge stronger links between research and practice, promote effective collaboration, open the door to technology and policy innovation, understand the synergies among economic and ecological goals, and prepare our students for the challenges of the coming decades. The Riley Fund has become a core part of our activities. Our goal is to make the Riley Leadership Awards one of the preeminent forms of recognition in the nation to set a standard for the field. The Riley scholarships and internships are an investment in the future. They bring talented young people into environmental careers and provide valuable experience and opportunities. The fund is supporting our ability to engage alumni and others in constructive dialogue on the future of water. Other programs building on this theme are also being planned. I also want to thank our wonderful program advisory board, and I think we have 11 here tonight, for all their contributions to the university and our students. All are prominent in the environmental and energy fields and are generous in sharing their time, wisdom, and experience. Special thanks this evening to the members of our Leadership Awards Committee, Stan Abramson, Gail Bingham, Jessica Fury, and Joanne Shatkin, all of whom are with us. Uh, we recently added two new members to the board, both of whom are alumni of the School of Public Affairs, Xiaomei Tan of the Global Environmental Facility at the World Bank, who had a World Bank commitment tonight, and Brian Keene of Smart Power, who will be closing the uh, program. Other mem board members with us this evening include Tim Fields, Diane Wood, Tracy Meehan, David Rajewski, Steve Harper, and Frank Prisnar. Congratulations to the recipients of the William K. Riley Environmental Leadership Awards, and say Obit Witherspoon of the Children's Environmental Health Network, and Dan Esty of Yale University, who just completed a tour as the Commissioner of the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection in Connecticut. So Dan is an old friend, but now we've made a new friend with NSA. <clears throat> we also are presenting Riley Scholarship Awards to Kavita Mack and Jennifer Fernandez. Both are talented and hardworking, and I know this because they're in my class, <laughs> first-year students in our Master of Public Policy program and will make major contributions in their careers. And I want to thank my colleagues Karen Baylor and Bradley Hardy, who served with me on the Scholarship Selection Committee. Thanks also to the excellent team that made this program possible, to Alexis Pasmino, event planner for the School of Public Affairs, Serena Sue, program assistant with the center, and Reardon Frost. Reardon helped organize the student dialogue that we had with um, our guests this afternoon. Uh, Danielle Miller Wagner has been in the middle of this project from the beginning, and her outstanding organizational skills and professionalism are key to our success. Thanks to Dan McCabin for a great partnership, and as always, to Gordon Binder of the World Wildlife Fund for his ideas and support. We are very grateful to our sponsors for making the Riley Fund and this program possible. All of our sponsors are listed in the program and in various other places uh, as you go along. 
But I especially want to thank our event sponsors for tonight, Intel, Coca-Cola, the Bipartisan Policy Center, MDB Incorporated, the Packard Foundation, and the National Environmental Education Foundation. And we hope after this program you will all join us uh, for a reception in the School of Public Affairs atrium, one of our gold lead certified buildings, and we will have guides to help uh, take you across the quadrangle to do that. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Bar Dr. Barbara Romzek, the Dean of the School of Public Affairs. Dr. Romzek is in her second year as Dean. She came to American University after holding several academic leadership positions at the University of Kansas. She's a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, a leader in the public administration field, and is widely recognized for her expertise in public management and accountability. She's had a busy and productive first two years, and I know that we will continue to keep her busy and productive. Uh, Dean Romzek has been a strong supporter of this initiative from the start, and I'm delighted that she will lead off our program. Please welcome Dean Barbara Romzek. Thank you, Dan. It's a privilege uh, for the School of Public Affairs to host uh, these distinguished guests and so many proponents of uh, protecting and preserving and advancing the quality of our environment. Senator Graham, I want to thank you for helping restore the Everglades and for your work with Bill Riley on the BP Commission. We're delighted that you're sharing your time and expertise with us. I want to also echo what Dan said and extend congratulations to this year's Riley Award recipients, to Dan Esty and Nse Witherspoon, for all their work in their respective domains, uh, advancing the cause of, of environmental uh, uh, protection. Uh, Dan has been justly praised for his leadership on integrating the energy-related functions in Connecticut with the, the Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. NSA is widely recognized for leading the Children's Environmental Health Network, a network that protects children from environmental hazards. And of course, we especially want to thank Bill Riley for joining us again. We take great pride in the partnership that he and Dan with the Center for Environmental Policy have constructed as a way to advance the important cause of uh, addressing the challenges we have in the environment. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of the recent report on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I don't have to tell anybody in the room that climate change is a problem, uh, that it's having sweeping effects. Uh, scientists are warning us about the long-term impact, melting ice caps, drought, storms. We've lived it. This, wh wherever you're from, you've lived it this year with extraordinary weather, whether it's too dry or too wet or too cold. Uh, the changes are significant, there are changes predicted, and they're only going to get worse unless we do something about greenhouse gas emissions, unless somehow or other we can bring them under control. So climate change is no longer just an issue for people who are interested in green issues. Climate change is a core global concern these days, and it's a concern that needs to be addressed internationally through trade negotiations, issues of competitiveness are affected by how we address environmental issues and public health, of course, and the Children's uh, Health Network is a good example of that. Because of the serious consequences of climate change, having long-term impacts, that we are, have a hard time in this country addressing policy issues for the environment because we are focused as a culture on short-term solutions. It's hard for us to see the longer term, but there are real serious questions of intergenerational justice, of intergenerational responsibility. What kind of an environment are we leaving for our children and for our neighbor's children? So our search for solutions, our search for ways to address the climate challenge issue inevitably leads us to the energy sector. Uh, our political system, which is full of worthy but unfortunately neglected proposals for change, uh, nonetheless can't address the issues because of our various forms of gridlock. Now I'm proud to say that we at American University, and in particular Dan through the Center for Environmental Policy, is taking a stand and tackling these issues. The, the Riley Fund for Environmental Governance and Leadership 
provides opportunities for us to discuss these things, to bring you together to talk about these things, to wrestle with the challenges of how we're going to face these issues, and most important, explore how we can address these together. Because one thing we do know is no one person is going to solve this. No one country is going to solve this. Climate change is truly a global issue and requires global cooperation. Now, we're thrilled with the progress that Dan and the center has been able to accomplish, especially with the help of the Riley Fund. And we're, we're grateful for the financial support that the centers have been able to make for educational forums, student scholarships, which we'll be talking about tonight, and research activities. All of those have become a reality because of the Riley Fund and the work that Dan has accomplished in the center. So addressing climate change and other environmental challenges are part of the School of Public Affairs because the School of Public Affairs is about public service. And addressing climate change is an important issue for all of us in the public domain. Now, the School of Public Affairs was founded on the principle of public service. Uh, we were uh, founded by, uh, in 34 to educate students for FDR's New Deal. So from FDR to the current President Obama, we have been recognized for our role as a School of Public Affairs in helping advance the public, in helping advance public cause, in helping advance uh, the uh, modern state so that we are uh, educating students who can go in and contribute to these agencies that are wrestling with these tough issues. So for the past 80 years, the School of Public Affairs has been working on issues of public service. Now I have to just take a little bit of time to break. The School of Public Affairs is ranked uh, as nationally as one of the top schools in the country and has been for a long time. Just this week, across my desk came another research piece that noted that the School of Public Affairs is internationally ranked in the top 10 as well. Uh, when the research is done on where the scholarly publications come through in public affairs, the American University is ranked number eight among the top journals. For people publishing the top journals, we're, we're number eight. So I'm very proud of what we have done over our 80 years. I'm very proud of what we're doing right now. And people like Dan and this, the activities of the center are central to the kind of things that we can accomplish. So just a few more things. Public affairs is about theory and practice. It doesn't do us any good to just publish theoretical articles in scholarly journals if we don't take those ideas and put them into the, into the public dialogue and to bring it together. Our location in DC, in the heart of the nation's capital, lets us make those connections. We are in the nexus of the dialogue between theory and practice, between dialogue and action. Our faculty and our alumni, our Policy analysts, public managers, their leaders in their fields. They contribute their expertise to our, the big issues of the day, including climate change. Our students are likewise engaged. They work on the theory and practice because we expose them to it in the classroom, but they are also exposed to it because we build internships into their experience. That, those internships give them the chance to take the theory and apply it in practice. And in turn, they get this wonderful professional experience that helps them make connections to important organizations, such as the Sierra Club, or the American Council on Renewable Energy, uh, or the White House or Capitol Hill. So tonight's event is a great example of how our faculty and our students and the expertise of our centers can bring together Im important ideas, important individuals to address the challenges we face. Tonight's ex event is a great example of that. Now, George Bernard Shaw famously <laughs> remarked that progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their mind can't change anything. So at the School of Public Affairs, we're in the business of opening minds. Uh, we're not, we not only produce scholars, and we don't just educate students for today. We educate students to solve problems today and to figure out how they can solve the problems they're going to face five years, ten years down the road. So we're not training them for just today. We're training them to be productive leaders and make significant contributions on into the future because they can address the questions of tomorrow and not just today. So we find ourselves with uh, uh, 
extraordinary group of talent in the room. We are addressing an important issue. We have one particular question we have to address. As we try to wrestle with environmental issues, we can't ignore the fact that most of our environmental challenges come from the fact that we, are, as human beings, are impacting the climate, the environment we live on. So I finish with a quote from a pioneer of modern environmental ethics, Aldo Leopold. Uh, he, he's commented that the hope of the future lies not in curbing the influence of human occupancy. It's already too late for that. But in creating a better understanding of the extent of that influence and creating a new ethic for its governance. So that is our challenge. Not that we're going to do away with the human impact on the environment, but what are we going to do about it? How are we going to recognize our impact and mo moderate it? So I know everyone in the audience is sensitive to the issues of, of uh, the environment and the challenges we face. I ask each of you to think, as you're listening to our conversations tonight, how you can make a greater impact on the environment for good. We all have significant impact on the environment on our daily lives. How can we do it in a positive way? So I now uh, turn it over to two uh, distinguished members of the Center for Environmental Policy's Governing Board, Stan Abramson and Steve Harper. If you'll come up, they're going to uh, make the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Rams. I appreciate that. Ensay. Ensay Obat Witherspoon is the executive director for the Children's Environmental Health Network here in Washington, D.C. In that capacity, she has served as one of the nation's leading voices advocating for children's health. Your leadership has been integral to allowing your organization to meet its goal of serving as the voice for children's environmental health here in the nation's capital. The Children's Environmental Health Network is a national, multidisciplinary organization whose mission is to protect the developing child from environmental health hazards and promote healthier environment. To achieve this mission, the network has designated certain goals. First, promoting the development of sound public health and child-focused national policy. Second, stimulating prevention-oriented research. Third, educating health professionals, policymakers, and community members in preventative strategies. And fourth, elevating public awareness of environmental hazards to children. The network has been at work since 1992 promoting these goals and has a commendable history of working with a wide range of stakeholders. This includes healthcare and childcare professionals, faith and policy leaders, parents and caregivers. The network has partnered with professional and advocacy organizations at the local and national levels, reaching a broad audience that extends from Washington, D.C to around the world. Just last year, the National Environmental Health Association presented the organization with the first Environmental Health Innovation Award in recognition of a pioneering program here in the district, the EcoHealthy Child Care Program. Among Ms. Witherspoon's many other accomplishments, she has served on the Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee for the US EPA and is a member of the Institute of Medicine's Environmental Health Sciences Roundtable. She has also served as chair of the environmental section of the American Public Health Association, co-chaired the National Conversation on Public Health and Chemical Exposures, which is sponsored by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, contributed her vision and leadership to numerous other organizations, served as the editor of the Child Care Settings Chapter, of Pediatric Environmental Health, which is published by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And she has contributed chapter on climate change and children's health to a book that has a great title. The way we will be 50 years from today 
60 of the world's greatest minds share their visions of the next half century. I have to say that we had some wonderful award candidates this year. As we reviewed Ms. Witherspoon's accomplishments, we took particular note of the fact that she is a leader who has recognized the power of collaboration and has accomplished this with a grace and style that brings out the very best in others. Unfortunately, that skill is often in short supply and not just in the area of environment and children's health. And say, I was telling my wife about you last weekend. Uh, my wife was an elementary school teacher and principal for over 35 years. And while we may not agree on everything, there is no disagreement when it comes to the fact that healthy children, children healthy in body and mind, learn better and are better prepared to be productive, healthy individuals. There's no higher goal, there's no sounder investment than in the health of our children. That's the soundest investment that a nation can make, that we can make, the health of our children. Please join me in congratulating one of this year's recipients of the William K. Riley Environmental Leadership Award, and say Obat Witherspoon. Riley Environmental Leadership Award presented to Nsedu Obat Witherspoon by the Center for Environmental Policy School of Public Affairs, American University, April 2014. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is beautiful. Good evening. Hi. Hi. It is such an honor to be here tonight with all of you, and I really want to thank Mr. Riley and the Center for Environmental, uh, Environmental Policy here for all of your support and acknowledgement of the very important and much-needed work that the Children's Environmental Health Network works on every single day. Mr. Esty, congratulations on your award as well. Very well deserved. Thank you to all of my many friends and colleagues that are here tonight. Gail Bingham, I hear you out there, and many others. <laughs> While I'm very humbled by this distinction, I'm very excited to share this award with our fantastic and hardworking staff. Carol, Hester, Christy, and Christine, can you please all stand up? You know I had to do this. And Sandra, I see you also. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your tireless work, again, each and every day on behalf of all of our children. It, it, it brings me great joy to know, work, and learn from each and every one of you. Thank you so much. I also want to thank our wonderful, supportive, and dedicated board of directors, most of whom are also here tonight. So please, could you stand? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> on top of all of their responsibilities and leadership roles, and they have many, Please know that I very much appreciate the time and energy that you devote not only to myself but to the network each and every day. I should say we're in the middle of a board meeting right now, so I really appreciate the flexibility that they made in order to also be here and to support tonight. My cousin and husband and three sweet children are also here. I absolutely love and adore all of you, and thank you so much for your continuous patience and support in all that I and inevitably we are all a part of. CEHN has been at this work for over 22 years, miraculously now. Um, looking over the last two decades, we are very proud to have been a part of the initial paradigm shift. The realization that children are not little adults and that their exposures to environmental health hazards create very serious and lifelong health implications. We are the advocates for Kenya, an eight-year-old Los Angeles native who is struggling to concentrate in second grade every day due to the life-changing fact that she was lead poisoned as a young baby. We are the champions for Sam, a 10-year-old boy in Wisconsin who makes great efforts to look at the positive aspects of his life while suffering from the harsh realities of childhood leukemia. We are the voice for my youngest son, Ayan, a vibrant four-year-old Maryland native who tries to maintain his winning smile and courage even when we're sitting in the ER for yet another serious asthma episode. And we are the pillars of justice for Crystal, 
an infant soon to be born into a low-income Hispanic family in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and all the challenges that growing up in Cancer Alley will bring to her, her precious and vulnerable life. So whether it's through CHN's work to promote much-needed chemical policy reform, or through our support of peer-reviewed science necessary to inform policy development, or through our National Eco-Healthy Child Care Program, which I love that promo earlier, that was great. <laughs> it's the only one of its kind in the nation working to bring environmental health education and recommendations to child care professional, the child care professional community and the licensing community alike. Or whether it's our work to chart a renewed vision and a blueprint for how to actually address and protect children of today in the U.S. from environmental hazards. The CEHM remains focused and determined to use our growing network, reputation, and expertise to continue to advocate for the health and safety of all children, serving as the voice that keeps the child at the center of all conversations and policy efforts. There's still a lot of ground to cover. We've come a long way on this journey, but there's certainly enough room for all of us, and we certainly invite all of you to be a part of that, and this is absolutely an honor. I really thank you again tonight, and thank you for helping to support all of us tonight. That's a tough act to follow. Um, when uh, Dan Fiorini and uh, Danielle Wagner asked me to make the presentation uh, to uh, Dan Esty of this award, I eagerly said yes. Uh, Dan is somebody that I've known off and on over the years and widely admire. We first met uh, in 1992. <clears throat> we overlapped a couple of months at EPA, and I was in a number of meetings with Dan, and the thing that I was always struck with was I always came out of meetings with Dan with more energy than I went into those meetings <laughs> with. His energy was infectious, and he's one of the few people I know who can actually speak cogently in complete paragraphs and complete pages on virtually any topic at hand. Um, um, beyond that, when, when I was reviewing Dan's resume and his Wikipedia page, I have to say it was a little bit of a downer. Um, you know, he's accomplished a tremendous amount so far, and I emphasize so far because he's a young man. And um, you didn't pay me for that compliment, but uh, uh, no, reading his CV is a little bit dispiriting because it made me ask myself, what the hell have I been doing with my life? <laughs> um, Dan currently is the director of the Center for Environmental Law and Policy at Yale and is also the Hill House Professor of Environmental Law and Policy and Director of Yale's World Fellows Program. In a previous incarnation at Yale, he headed up <clears throat> the University Center for Business and the Environment. While in that capacity, he wrote one of his many books, uh, Green to Gold. Along with his co-author, Andrew Will uh, Winston, Dan did some of the best, earliest work on how smart companies can integrate their environmental and business strategies Intel was happy to be one of the companies that was profiled in there as, as what they call wave riders. Uh, prior to his, his most recent Yale post, he was commissioner of environment and uh, environmental protection and energy, rather, in Connecticut. And in that role, uh, the State Department uh, pioneered a number of things, one of which uh, I have a tremendous amount of uh, respect for, which is the first green bank, the green bank concept was, has been tried at the federal level many, many times. It's never gotten past the goal line. But in Connecticut, they were able to do it, and it's a really great idea for self-sustaining funding of renewable energy and energy efficiency. Uh, in addition to his various day jobs, uh, Dan has done a lot of media appearances over time, including with three of my favorites, the Colbert Rapport, O'Reilly, not Riley, but O'Reilly, and <laughs> and Glenn Beck, and Dan, at the reception, I'm curious to know which of those three people you consider to be the most successful self-parody. <laughs> um, cl closing on a personal note, the last, time, the last time Dan and I crossed paths was at a clean energy uh, symposium at the Aspen Institute. And I don't know if you've ever done an Aspen Institute symposium, but you meet in a really nice place for three days, you, you think big thoughts, and you occasionally get to uh, go out and enjoy the environment. So at the end of the second day, I signed up for the quote unquote aggressive climb up Ajax Mountain. And uh, I knew I was in trouble when I was in the van with Dan and a couple of other guys who were all 20, at least 20 years younger than me. 
Plus, they had hiking boots and water, and I had neither. <laughs> but I told, I told myself, no problem. I grew up in Colorado. I spent much of my youth and college years backpacking the 14ers. Um, I, could, I could do it. Well, let's just say, not so much. It was a, it was a near-death experience. And, <laughs> and, and Dan kicked my butt. Um, so in addition to having a stellar record of helping to protect the environment, uh, it is evident that Dan is pretty good at enjoying that environment as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Esty. Thank you, I forgot about that. I, I, it's, the, it's the same verbiage, so I won't read it. I'm speechless. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, it is a huge pleasure to be honored, but a special pleasure to receive the William K. Riley Award. And I say that from the bottom of my heart because so much of what I have done with my life and my career builds on a platform of the four years I spent at the EPA working for Bill Riley. And it was not just learning about the environment, which of course it was, but also about leadership and about how to make change happen. And in that time, one of the things we did was the Rio Earth Summit. Some of you will recall this. Alan Hecht is laughing from the second <laughs> row. There were certain elements to that that was enormously challenging, but I'm not gonna tell the story of the Rio Earth Summit. I'm gonna tell you the story of Morris Strong, the great Canadian who led that Earth Summit, who came through the EPA several times in the years ahead of the meeting and said to me at one moment, Dan, you know, there's only two possible outcomes when you bring all these leaders from across the world. And by the time they were gathered, it was 120 presidents and prime ministers. Said, Dan, only two outcomes, success or real success. <laughs> and I am sad to report that so much uh, has gone on that has not delivered real success but when we look at the history of the last 50 years, those four years that we were at EPA together produced an enormous amount of real success. And it was a huge pleasure to be with not only Bill Riley, from whom I learned so much, but so many who are here, including Dan Fiorino, who uh, led our charge in the policy office, and uh, others, Dave Cohen, who's hiding in the back, who taught us all how to tell the story in a way that would be compelling and Gordon Binder, who's already been mentioned, who I worked with uh, hour after hour, day after day, and learned so very much from. And there are eight others here who I won't try to go through all of or will be here all night. But it really um, is a lesson in a number of things that I carry forward to this day. One was that you do need an integrated approach. So you heard that I helped create a Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, D-E-E-P. But I always joke that I spell it with three E's, energy, the environment, and the economy. Because you really cannot succeed on any of those without bringing the others along. And that was lesson number one from the Bill Riley era at the EPA. Second lesson was you have to do big change on a broad base of political support. And I'm proud that so much of what I got done in the last three years in Connecticut was on a virtually unanimous basis in terms of state legislative support. I don't think you can do what we need to do in the environmental arena, turn the corner towards sustainability, address the issue of climate change as the dean has indicated we must, on a single party basis. So I learned that lesson of bipartisanship and I tell you to this day that one of my favorite quiz questions is to ask people what they think the final Senate vote was on the Clean Air Act of 1990. Now there are people in this room who know the answer to that. <laughs> But I will tell you the average student at Yale, you can tell the B students from the A students. The B students believe it was 51-49, and the A students know it takes 60 votes to get a majority. <laughs> but the answer was 89 to 11, because we worked together, not just the EPA, but the entire executive branch with the Congress to find a path forward that a lot of people could sign on to. And why that matters is because when you do something big, it will be screwed up in a dozen little ways. And you need to have lots of people there to help you the next year and the year after to fix it. 
And that is a huge lesson. And one that, again, I tell you in Connecticut, the, le the big package we got through in 2011 had 30 things wrong that I had to fix over the next two years. But because it had been done on a bipartisan basis, we had that support. I do think that my career has been devoted to trying to redefine how environmental protection gets done, to create a 21st century model. I think I'm allowed to say that sitting in an academic setting. A 21st century model of how to do regulation that is lighter, faster, leaner, and fundamentally seeks to engage the business community, harness the creativity of entrepreneurs in solving problems. And the same is true on the energy side. A 21st century approach that recognizes the limits of government and tries to use limited government resources to leverage private capital and to use the government power to de-risk investments in clean energy, efficiency, renewables, and more. And I am pleased that the Connecticut model is now being seen as something worthy of attention. And it's a special pleasure to have that recognized here tonight as well. So thank you all very much for coming out. It is really the pleasure of a lifetime and humbling to receive the Bill Riley Award. Good evening. There is a fundamental distinction between the roles of those who exercise leadership and those who exercise authority in government and other large organizations. These functions can overlap but remain distinct. For those who occupy positions of authority, the exercise of true leadership can be difficult in the extreme. The restraints of law, regulatory process, political considerations, and the inertia of intergovernmental consultation can make it almost impossible to clearly articulate necessary truths or blaze a new and better trail toward sound policy and outcomes. Martin Luther King never served in a position of authority, but his moral authority was unparalleled in American history. On rare occasions, when the stars are in proper alignment, leadership and authority are combined in one person at a particular time and place. No doubt we all have our favorite examples of this happy confluence of events, Churchill, Lincoln, FDR all come to mind. In the realm of conservation and environmental policy and governance, William K. Riley stands out as an individual who has been able to lead on policy on matters of policy while exercising authority judiciously to implement those policies to the benefits of the benefit of the nation's environment and the citizens who depend on it. As a state official managing delegated EPA programs in the Midwest for much of Bill's tenure at EPA, I can testify to the influ influence that Bill Riley had on those of us working throughout the nation. In, this, in the setting of compelling aspirational goals, goals that actually elicited concrete actions, no one was better than Bill Riley. No one is better than Bill Riley. Moreover, he communicated a set of principles to guide action which was grounded in the best science and wise and prudent practice. Let me offer one example from my own experience. At EPA, Bill announced his 3350 program, a voluntary effort to target 17 priority chemicals. The aim was to reduce releases and transfers of those chemicals by 33% by 1992 and 50% by 1995. As it turns out, all of those goals were met and exceeded with the 92 goal achieved a year in advance. This national invitation to pollution reduction energized many of us in state and local governments, but most of all in private industry all over the country. While serving as director of the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, I convened meetings in St. Louis, Kansas City, and Springfield to promote the 3350 program. The response was overwhelming packing hotel meeting rooms with corporate environmental health and safety officials anxious to brag about their accomplishments and promote their efforts at pollution prevention and reduction while learning from others uh, who'd had similarly, similar stories to report. Consider, too, these other examples of imaginative and consequential leadership which Bill Riley was able to operationalize both at EPA and in the other non-governmental and organizations as well as in uh, uh, 
private industry, which, uh, which he has run and had a lot to do with uh, managing. No net loss of wetlands. Remember that one? Tremendously consequential. Geographic or watershed programs at scale, and I'm thinking of the Great Lakes, the Gulf of Mexico, et cetera. Market-based incentives, most notably the acid rain trading program embodied in the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. And of course, programs like Green Lights and other voluntary programs, again, 3350 comes to mind, which mobilize the expertise and goodwill of the private sector and civil society. It is a great pleasure to introduce the man in whose name we gather here tonight. It is particularly important that the students here tonight understand what he has accomplished. So again, let me recap. Bill served with distinction as administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and as president of the Conservation Foundation. As Dan indicated, he headed the U.S. delegation to the U.N. Earth Day Summit, Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, and more recently, co-chaired the President, uh, President Obama's National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill and offshore drilling. Bill is also Chairman Emeritus of the Board of World Wildlife Fund and Chair Chairman Emeritus of the Board of the Climate Works Foundation. He's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. A graduate of Yale and Harvard Law, Bill served in the U.S. Army to the rank of Captain. Please join me in honoring Bill Riley, who embodies the best in authoritative leadership in American conservation and environmental policy. Hey, you give me another five, ten years, Tracy, maybe I'll be worthy of about a fourth of that uh, <laughs> magnificent statement. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Harper mentioned O'Reilly, and I, I am reminded that countless times when I am arriving at airports and I'm getting picked up by a driver who has my name, invariably he is either completely relieved <laughs> or very disappointed. <laughs> Nobody is indifferent to Bill O'Reilly. I uh, am most happy here, I think, in the company of students. That was true a year ago. It was true this afternoon. Uh, Barbara, uh, Dan, you are very fortunate to uh, have the students that you have. It has occurred to me, are, are these people being cherry-picked here? I mean, <laughs> the degree of ambition and earnest attention to questions of public policy, quite sophisticated ones are very moving to me. I think that uh, I foresee for so many of the public policy students that we have sat down with really great futures and great contributions to their lives and to those of the country. It is my pleasure to present the William K. Riley scholarships to two of these outstanding students. And the first is Kavita Mock. Kavita has a joint engineering degree from Cornell in civil and environmental engineering. And she has been on the front line for the Los Angeles Public Works System of a set of problems which uh, I would have thought you might have encountered later in life uh, that might have made a lot of people jaded. And that is confronting the array of permits, federal, state, local, and then local objections and lawsuits occasioned by trying to remove the sediment behind a dam, sediment that had accumulated because of a large fire which then left the grass and the mud uncovered and it washed, it washed into the reservoir and um, risked creating a very severe hazard. Well, I understand that um, although you began three years ago, that effort continues. Uh, welcome to California. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act and uh, CEQA are um, unfortunately capable of uh, highly obstructive and as well as very constructive use, and you encountered it all. And I think you are very well prepared for um, the future that you have chosen in public policy, and it's a great pleasure for me to present you with this certificate for the William K. Riley Scholarship of 2014.
And the second awardee is Jennifer Fernandez. Jennifer is a uh, BA summa cum laude graduate of the University of San Francisco and uh, who wrote, uh, I, I noticed in your, in your background, uh, an honors thesis on the redevelopment of South of Market in San Francisco, which is one of the areas of revival in the United States as so many people who work in other places, most specifically Cupertino and, and the headquarters of Google, um, are choosing to live. And we have a bit of a crisis of an issue in San Francisco because the Google buses which take the people, collect them in San Francisco and drive down to Silicon Valley are um, objected to by the neighbors as they line up and, uh, and idle by the, by the sidewalk. Well, what that really is, is a measure of tremendous success on the part of cities reestablishing their desirability as a place to live. And uh, that, of course, has led other companies to see that they don't need to locate down in Silicon Valley if there is so much interest in San Francisco. And they are, they are moving there. Well, more recently, she has worked with America, this, America's Vista's Green Strategies, which has, has as its objective the, the greening of affordable housing by educating the developers and then the residents as well. In, in how to create very desirable, livable, and efficient, energy efficient uh, housing, affordable housing. These are very practical experiences that the two of you have had. And uh, I think that uh, you will have learned and you do know of one of the major priorities I heard the mayor of New York speak to just the other evening. Uh, of trying to figure out how to ensure that uh, in those places that are most desirable, uh, some proportion of the housing is built affordably, and that the kinds of amenities and the green investments and the HVAC systems and the energy efficiency and all the rest that we want in, um, in the regular market housing is available to those who occupy affordable housing. But well done, and I'm very pleased to present you with the 2014. Talking, we're talking a lot about public policy tonight, and I want to say something. Uh, I have the reputation of having a sort of last in, first, first out approach to whatever I've just picked up or learned. And, and, and of course, <laughs> well, it's true. Uh, in, in the course of the last year, I have been working as part of President Obama's Global Development Council. And um, this is a seven member group, uh, it has uh, federal officials as well. Uh, secretaries of the various agencies, but the, the, the non-government people uh, are just a few of us. We, um, we have encountered uh, the, the concerns of the president to identify priorities for the second term, and particularly for his legacy in foreign policy and foreign assistance. And having come to this, having been out of the development field for a long time, I, I wrote my law school thesis on land reform in Chile and thought that I would go into international development at that time, it has struck me as really extraordinarily important and is so important that the country at some point understand the tremendous successes that have been achieved in foreign policy and foreign assistance particularly in the last 15 years or so. I don't think this is at all understood and this must explain why the public is so prepared according to most polls to throw foreign aid under the bus in the event of the need to reduce the budget um, deficit. But um, when you think of the numbers that uh, have been achieved, there were something like 14 million who died, children who died before the age of five as a result of a variety of diseases, diarrhea, uh, malaria, and measles. And that has been reduced in half in the last 10 or 12 years. The number of new incidences of polio has dropped from 350,000 a year to 30 last year. The AIDS numbers that uh, people have been saved as a result of one of the US programs 
have uh, equal at least two and a half million lives that uh, would otherwise be extant today. These are marvelous numbers. They really deserve to be known. And they're the consequence also of some reforms in foreign assistance that are very cost effective, very rigorous, cash for performance, a pay on delivery, um, new transparency requirements. The uh, best example, I think, of the uh, pay for performance is the gift of Norway of a billion dollars to Brazil to protect the Amazon against further uh, deforestation. But the money didn't pass until the evidence of effectiveness was in. That is increasingly the way that this kind of assistance, best of it, is being done. And I just wanted to mention it because it's a success of public policy and one in which the um, thoughtfulness, the uh, sophistication, and the contribution of the United States, the generosity of the United States, has been very notable. Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, who, whom I first met, I think, in 1972, when I was at the Council on Environmental Quality in the Nixon White House, and he was a senator, state senator in Florida, who sponsored the Florida Land and Water Management Act. And I was able to obtain for him an endorsement of President Nixon, which I think probably surprised a lot of people at the time that uh, the president was uh, so supportive of uh, protecting areas of critical environmental concern and promote, promoting development of regional benefit, which, which his statute did. Uh, he is a uh, former two-term governor of Florida, three-term United States senator. One of his highly regarded campaign initiatives, which he continued after he was a successful senator, was to carry out a variety of jobs, essentially um, carrying baggage, uh, pitching manure. Um, he carried the baggage, I understand, of his opponent, which had to be de really delicious. Uh, I, I could only imagine the chagrin of his opponent arriving at a hotel where, for that day, he was the, uh, the bag boy. And uh, he... Uh, attracted a great deal of attention and actually, I think, as he has explained many times, sensitized himself to the lives of a whole variety of types of work and, and uh, experience. He um, was a very effective governor on behalf of the environment. We, the Everglades were mentioned this evening, which was a priority for him. And um, I can say that um, as a senator, I experienced him very directly. He was a member of the Senate uh, Committee on Environment and Public Works, to which the EPA reports. And um, sometime during that period, uh, a Senate job was offered to a person who was riding in a car with me and who turned it down. This was an appointment to fill a uh, temporary vacancy. And I was quite surprised. And this individual said to me, well, you work with all of them. Who do you want to be like? It was a particularly low point in that uh, person's uh, tenure at government. And I said, well, how about Graham? All right, the person said, I'll give you Graham. Who else? <laughs> <laughs> well, Graham's a heavyweight, an adult, and uh, it was a pleasure to work with him and watch him. And uh, he, was Senate, he was chairman of the Senate Ener uh, uh, Intelligence Committee and um, undoubtedly listened to a lot of our phone calls in that capacity. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, I, I happened to hear Senator Feinstein say at a recent uh, dinner event in Washington that the, the huge strategic error they had made was listening to Angela Merkel and not Francois Hollande, where there was a lot more interesting <laughs> conversation. <laughs> but uh, he, he probably knows a lot more about you than you know about him as a result of this service. Uh, most important, I think, he, um, he is so widely respected that um, it, uh, I think, fell naturally to the White House person who invited me to be co-chair of the Oil Spill Commission to begin by saying Senator Graham has agreed to do it as your co-chair. Well, it turned out that they said the same thing to him about me. And uh, <laughs> it wasn't true at the time they said either one, but it, it worked. This um, period of uh, working with him as co-chair of the Oil Spill Commission was hugely satisfying. I, I can't think of a disagreement we had about the importance of the staff's integrity and in protecting the staff and following the facts, as the President has said we should do, to where they led. 
and uh, the integrity, the reputation, the stature that we had was so very significantly increased, guaranteed really, by the presence of our co-chair, Senator Bob Graham, one of America's really great statesmen. Bob. Well, yes, I forgot to mention something that I think is very important. Um, when, um, when we met, we were to meet with the president one day, I had a book, The uh, Dreams of My Father, that I wanted to give to my daughter, and I wanted to ask the president to sign it. And I asked Bob, do you think it's cheesy to ask the president to autograph a book while we're having a meeting reporting on the Oil Spill Commission? He said, let me tell you, as an author, authors love to sign their books. <laughs> Well, we have on hand here some of the senator's books. America, the owner's manual, and some of you have seen them, but he didn't bring the, the keys to the kingdom, which draws upon his experience as chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee to tell a very lurid, gripping story. You can read it as I have on Kindle, and I strongly recommend it. And I'm sure that if you get copies of it, he'd be glad to sign them. <laughs> Take it away. Thank you, Bill, and I'm certain that those last comments will not take away excessively from the uh, admiration uh, that this audience holds for you. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate those commercial uh, remarks, and in a moment, I'd like to talk a little bit more about some of the ways in which our lives have uh, intersected and uh, influenced each other. But I want to start by thanking American University uh, first, uh, for uh, having this focus on public policy, uh, a focus on encouraging young people uh, not to just be passive spectators, but to be actively involved in the life of their communities and of this nation uh, and world. That, since I left the Senate in 2005, has been my passion, uh, is uh, how to energize Americans to do what our founding fathers thought was fundamental, uh, and that was citizen engagement uh, in the lives of their fellow citizens. Uh, I also want to thank American University for being the university which educated my uh, oldest daughter. Uh, Adele and I uh, have four daughters. Our oldest is uh, Gwen, uh, and she received her law degree. Uh, here at American University. Now, there was a certain degree of fraud uh, in the awarding of that law degree. <laughs> she wanted to be an environmental lawyer, of uh, which I know some of the uh, members of the audience uh, are in that proud profession. Uh, she was taught at American University that the uh, definition, uh, the ultimate objective of an environmental lawyer was to be Bambi's guardian ad litem. Uh, that was her aspiration. When she got into actual practice, she found out that being an environmental lawyer meant applying for pipelines for the Federal Energy Regulatory uh, Commission. Uh, let me say, uh, an also slightly commercially, uh, my uh, daughter, Gwen Adelson, my daughter, uh, is now running for Congress. She hopes to join uh, Dan's wife uh, as a new member of Congress. I am, I am, I am very uh, proud of her, and uh, Dan was telling me the reasons that his wife ran, which was the fact that if good people don't offer themselves for public office, the office will not go unfilled, but it will go to someone uh, who has less of a commitment to the public uh, good. I also want to thank all the people who've been recognized here tonight for their uh, contributions to the environment of this great nation and the two uh, younger ladies uh, who have already made a contribution but with this scholarship and recognition uh, will continue to grow uh, in their commitment uh, to a quality environment 
for this and future generations. I mentioned that uh, Bill, myself, have intersected at several occasions, and he's already uh, mentioned some of those. Uh, when Bill was a student uh, at uh, the Harvard Law School, uh, his third year thesis was written on the topic of land reform in Chile. Uh, I was at the Harvard Law School three years before Bill, and I wrote my third year uh, thesis on the Federal Housing Administration building codes in Hialeah, Florida, and how they affected water and sewer systems in Dade County. Now that shows the difference between an idealist uh, and a pragmatist <laughs> in terms of their basic uh, orientation. Uh, then, as Bill said, we, uh, we intersected in 1972, and I was a, a young state senator, and Bill was an experienced uh, federal bureaucrat, uh, and we worked together on a very comprehensive set of land and water management legislation, which served uh, Florida very well for uh, over four decades. Uh, we also were together at the uh, 1992 uh, Earth Summit in Rio. Uh, Bill was our leader. Uh, I was a member of the delegation and tried to, to pay attention and respect uh, to his directives and demands. Uh, and then um, <laughs> in 2010, the call from the president's office uh, relative to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. I want to disassociate myself from the comments that Bill made uh, as to subterfuge. Uh, uh, the president was extremely honest with both of us. Uh, we had both accepted instantaneously, and therefore uh, he could make the comment to each of us that the other had already uh, accepted. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill joined uh, with a career uh, both in government and the private sector and uh, uh, in other areas as a leader uh, in the environment. Uh, I served as a recovering politician in step three of the AA program of uh, recovery. Uh, I wanted to talk a few uh, moments this evening about some of the lessons that uh, we learned uh, during the uh, BP oil spill uh, inquiry. Uh, I think these lessons are important uh, because they are so universal. Uh, they apply uh, to many uh, of the major environmental issues that we face, such as uh, issues of sustainability uh, and climate change. Uh, one of those lessons that we learned was that the United States was not, as it purported to be, uh, the number one nation in the world in offshore oil safety. Uh, in fact, uh, the truth was quite to the contrary. Uh, there were uh, numerous instances of our uh, lack of being number one. Uh, one was the fact that there are very few statistics collected uh, on safety in an offshore environment. Uh, and today, uh, the uh, Department of Interior is attempting to uh, adopt a rule which will cause near misses a critical part of the safety record of most industries uh, to be recorded in the offshore oil industry, which they have not been historically. Uh, and there is substantial resistance uh, to uh, adding that to the list of data. But the data that we do have, for instance, on fatalities, which is a hard thing uh, to avoid, uh, is that for every uh, one death on a rig uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, excuse me, if one death on a rig in the North Sea, uh, which is primarily the UK and Norway, there are three deaths on rigs uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, indicating that uh, our uh, safety uh, is not uh, at the level that it should be. Uh, there's also a difference in terms of the approach to safety. The uh, most advanced countries in the world, such as Norway and Australia, uh, use what is called a safety case, in which the approach to safety 
is to ask the question, what are the risks involved at this particular site with this particular technology? And what can we as the uh, exploration consortium of companies do to mitigate uh, those risks? Uh, the United States uses a prescriptive approach to safety in which there is a punch list. Uh, have you done the following 150 things? And if you can punch the list appropriately, uh, you will get your permit. We've recommended our commission that we move from the prescriptive approach uh, to uh, the uh, safety case. Uh, that has not yet been adopted. Uh, we also recommended that there be an independent industry funded uh, safety entity. Uh, many industries which have had the near-death experience that BP was to offshore oil drilling, such as the chemical industry after the Bhopal incident in India uh, and the nuclear commercial industry after Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, recognized that this was no longer a situation of an individual company uh, being responsible. Uh, this was an issue in which there was a culture throughout the industry which, if continued, uh, threatened uh, the survival of the industry. Uh, we have recommended that there be such a independent uh, agency uh, as that uh, which operates in chemical and nuclear uh, commercial uh, for the offshore oil industry to bring a second set of eyes uh, to the regulatory agencies uh, in terms of the level of safety uh, that is being maintained. We found that the Macondo event was a preventable event. Uh, had the steps of safety at the highest levels uh, been in place, uh, we would not have uh, had the opportunity uh, to spend a year together uh, learning about the uh, industry and trying to diagnose uh, why uh, this event had occurred. I think the lessons that uh, we learned in terms of America's position in safety uh, were that especially as we embark on deeper and more risky exploration sites, uh, that it is critical uh, that we raise the level of safety commitment uh, and that uh, enhanced and sustained focus on industry by the individual entities, by the industry as a whole and by government uh, is critical. Second lesson that we learned is that the Gulf of Mexico is an integrated water unit divided arbitrarily uh, into the political jurisdictions of its uh, collective countries. This was first uh, brought to our attention uh, because of the proximity of Mexican oil to the location of the BP oil event. Mexico uh, was also our first target because it was beginning uh, to aggressively explore for the first time deep water drilling. It had done substantial drilling onshore and in shallow waters, but not at the deep water that of BP and the other uh, major developments in the Gulf of Mexico in the last decade. Uh, Mexico also is under economic pressure. 10 to 15 percent of its national budget comes from the income generated uh, by its oil and gas industry. So it was clear that they were going uh, to start uh, with their first efforts at offshore oil drilling uh, and that uh, it was important that they start uh, from a, a high set of standards and that together Mexico and the United States uh, could uh, elevate our safety game uh, in the Gulf of Mexico to acceptable levels. Since uh, the co cooperation with Mexico uh, has commenced. Another uh, feature has come into the Gulf of Mexico, and that is 
uh, the interest of Cuba uh, in offshore oil drilling. Uh, Cuba has drilled now uh, three uh, dry wells, uh, but as Bill and I found, Bill in several trips to Cuba together last January, uh, there is renewed interest in spite of this, uh, these three failures uh, to drill uh, in the Cuban waters of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, in large part uh, motivated by the fact that they have seismic records which have given them and potential uh, private sector partners enough confidence in the fact that there are commercially available oil and gas deposits uh, in the Cuban waters uh, to justify the significant investment that it will take in exploration. And second, the fact that Cuba has received most of its oil and uh, gas to date from Venezuela, an increasingly unstable partner. Uh, the, uh, in order for Cuba uh, to be able to drill uh, at a high level of safety, uh, it is going to be necessary that they have access uh, to some U.S. capabilities. Uh, for instance, uh, there is no capability to respond to an accident should one occur uh, in the Cuban area of the Gulf of Mexico. The closest response capabilities are in Galveston, Texas, uh, and Houston. Uh, second, the, uh, there's only one oil rig in the world that meets the, the test to be available uh, without uh, U.S. Uh, uh, engagement, uh, which means that it has less than 10 percent of U.S. content uh, on the uh, drilling platform. Uh, if, the, if the Cubans are going to drill at acceptable levels uh, to the areas of the United States that are most threatened, and I don't want to be parochial, but a slight look at a map will tell you <laughs> what the most threatened place is. Uh, it's going to be necessary for there to be uh, some modifications of the embargo uh, to allow us to participate in a response uh, a team for, with, Mec with Cuba and uh, to be able to allow higher levels of technology uh, to be used in their drilling operations. Uh, this is this issue of modifying the embargo is a very uh, controversial uh, one in any area, and it will be uh, controversial uh, here. Uh, but I hope that we will have the wisdom to not allow uh, undifferentiated ideology to get in the way of very targeted pragmatism uh, as to the U.S. interest uh, in having all forms of offshore drilling in the Gulf of Mexico done uh, to high standards of uh, safety. Uh, we all have a common stake uh, in the action of, the, of other nations uh, in achieving this objective. Uh, the third lesson learned is the opportunity for restoration of the Gulf. Uh, Deepwater Horizon has created uh, an unprecedented level of public attention to the condition of the Gulf, but it it's alone was not the cause of that condition. The Gulf was in trouble uh, before Deepwater Horizon. Uh, there were areas referred to as the dead zone uh, southwest of New Orleans uh, where the lack of oxygen uh, caused by a number of, of uh, uh, industrial and other activities uh, had led a size, almost the size of the state of Connecticut uh, to be almost uh, without uh, animal or plant life. Uh, second, Louisiana has been losing uh, its wetlands at a rate of one football field every 30 minutes uh, for years, uh, and that uh, has significantly reduced the safety zone between the Gulf and the populated areas of uh, the southern 
uh, states. Uh, the, uh, we recognized that this was going to be an opportunity uh, because there would be a substantial uh, resource of funds available to do a serious restoration of the Gulf, uh, particularly the fines that have and will be collected uh, from the transgressors. Uh, and it was thus our recommendation that 80% of those fine monies should be devoted to the purpose of restoration of the Gulf, and the Congress agreed uh, to that uh, in adopting the Restore uh, Act a year ago. Uh, we think this is an important opportunity, one not to be missed. Uh, there are some concerns about the relatively slow start of the restoration effort. Uh, the fact that, uh, as in so many cases, there is a conflict between those who are looking for immediate gratification uh, and those who are looking for the longer term interest of the Gulf. Um, there have been some disheartening uh, examples of where the 80% of the money that is to be used for restoration of the Gulf uh, is being used for short-term <laughs> economic benefits such as a minor league baseball stadium uh, and a convention center. Hard to justify those as making much of a contribution to restoration of the uh, Gulf. Uh, and finally, uh, the role of science uh, in uh, the restoration of the Gulf and the protection of its waters uh, and uh, in our other major environmental challenges. Uh, Bill was the first to point out that as we began to try to uh, seek answers to questions of how to respond uh, to the uh, outpouring of uh, oil into the Gulf of Mexico, uh, what had we learned in the some two decades since the last major uh, accident, uh, and that was Exxon Valdez under quite different circumstances uh, in Alaska, but circumstances that uh, one would have thought would have motivated uh, a serious and aggressive scientific effort uh, to prepare us for future such events. Uh, and unfortunately, the answer was that on some important questions, such as the use of dispersants in deep water, uh, there was very little enhancement of our scientific knowledge uh, base. Uh, I am pleased to say that uh, because of the action of the administration and the Congress uh, and individual states, that there has been an unprecedented level of scientific activity to understand the Gulf and prepare for future uh, adverse incidents from the National Science Foundation, the industry itself, the National Academy of Science, uh, and funds appropriated directly by the Congress. Uh, the, we believe that uh, this is the most fundamental uh, step that can be taken uh, to prepare, uh, hopefully to avoid, uh, but uh, at least mitigate the consequences of future adverse events similar to Deepwater Horizon. Uh, I approach all of these lessons uh, from the spirit of optimism. I believe that the, uh, the arc of uh, human progress is upward. Uh, I believe that uh, there are, there's always the necessity of, of hope uh, matched with uh, action. Uh, last night, my wife and I attended uh, a play which I would recommend. Uh, the title is Camp David, and the subject is the 13 days that President Carter uh, and the leaders of Israel uh, and Egypt spent together at Camp David attempting to arrive at a peace settlement. Uh, I have a personal story to tell about uh, that event. It was uh, March of 1979. Uh, I received, I was in my first weeks as governor of Florida, received a 
telephone call from the White House. And the message was that it appeared as if uh, an agreement was close at hand and that planning was underway for the signing of the treaty uh, and the celebratory events. Uh, I was honored uh, with Fidel to be invited. We, of course, accepted. Uh, and on the day that the treaty was signed, uh, we're on the lawn of the White House uh, to witness it. Uh, that evening, there was a dinner. The dinner was held in a large, white, circus-like tent with a hundred round tables, uh, each with ten chairs. Uh, my wife and I arrived that evening uncharacteristically early, uh, and uh, at our table, uh, there was a beautiful vase of flowers and two uh, even earlier than ourselves occupants. One of those was a former Egyptian general who was now a member of the Egyptian parliament and his translator. The general told us his life story, including the three times that he had gone to war uh, with Israel. Um, as the evening progressed, our table gradually filled, uh, and the man who ended up sitting to my left uh, was the former and to be future uh, Prime Minister of Israel, Itzhak Rabin. And he told me of his first visit to the United States, which had occurred when he was a young second lieutenant in the Israeli Defense Force where he had come to study the aerial photographs the United States had taken of the Sinai in order to pre prepare for what would become one of the four instances in which he fought against uh, Egypt. Uh, at the appointed hour, the th three uh, heads of state uh, stood at the back of the tent and the national anthems of each nation played uh, and the three leaders walked uh, to their central table. And as they were doing so, uh, Mr. Rabin leaned over to me and said that I never thought I would be in a situation in which the only thing that stood between me and an Egyptian general was a vase of flowers. <laughs> I believe that uh, we, uh, we have that same uh, commitment to hope and aspiration that the best of our uh, instincts and abilities will be applied uh, to achieve the best of quality of our life and our environment uh, for ours and future generations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob, for that uplifting statement and that account of um, the experience of Macondo, which we all hope so very much if we have to repeat is not nearly so destructive. That's said by the way, by someone who has gone through two of these things, Exxon Valdez and uh, as Dan Esty, who worked very closely with me on it, remembers, and then Macondo again. I want to um, say thank you to American University Barbara, to Dan, for all of the work that has gone into the efforts over the past year to make the center a relevant and effective instrument for bringing together students with decision makers and focusing on serious policy questions to the advisory board, to the um, university. And this university is, um, as I have learned and I did not really know before beginning last year, uh, is making a tremendous contribution, not just to the education of students here, which it certainly is doing, and those, as I have mentioned, that I have met are really stunning, but also to the city. It's the eighth largest employer in the city. And so I think about the largest, maybe Brian Dean can tell us this, uh, the largest uh, holder of, uh, installer of solar power, 
It's committed to uh, being carbon neutral in 2020. I think it's greener than Yale, Dan. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, er everywhere I... <laughs> Every, everywhere I look, uh, there's a compactor with a solar unit. Uh, the, the, the garage has on top of it enough solar to power the lighting. And uh, in every respect, it's a, it's a very distinguished effort underway here, accomplishment, to work in motion, and, and uh, something to be very proud of. And I, I think everyone associated with the university is. I certainly am. Over the coming years, we really hope to take on a number of issues, and one that we spoke about with the president of the university a little while ago is uh, to look at water technologies, some of which are really potentially profoundly important, Bob, in addressing the dead zone, that monitor nutrients, some of them apparently from the air, inform uh, applicators, farmers, of uh, the need to put on this much and not much more of phosphates and nitrates to regulate the uh, gradual um, uh, release into the Missouri and the Mississippi River basins and um, do so much to improve our waters on the way to the Gulf, but then finally to reduce the nutrient load that's mostly responsible for that dead zone as it reaches the Gulf. I think this is a place that can be the cockpit for some very important consideration of those technologies of how to bring them into serious commercial use and promote their export. There were recently four cabinet officers here at the same time looking at environmental exports. And it occurred to me when President Kerwin said this to us today, I, I'm not aware of another university that uh, has so readily been able to assemble four cabinet officers on anything. And um, as the President said, it really helps that it's a cab ride away and not an airplane mm -hmm. ride. Well, it's also um, a worthwhile issue and very substantial people who are addressing it. So for those reasons, I'm so grateful to the attention to these kinds of questions, to all of you for, for coming. There's so many friends of mine in this audience, and I, I, uh, so many stories I could tell beginning with Dan. I cannot conceive of a more appropriate winner of this award. NC, you and I just had the chance to meet, and uh, I really like kids a lot. I just want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I recently gave an hour-long presentation to two classes of five-year-olds up in Brooklyn, and um, I told stories about pandas and jaguars and leafcutter ants and elephants. And uh, I had learned from my own grandchildren that, well, pandas eat a lot. And they, they eat these non-nutritious bamboo. And because they eat so much, there's so little nutrition, they have to poop 40 times a day. <laughs> well, I had them in the palm of my hand. After <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a more attentive audience. <laughs> Anyway, the work you do is obviously marvelous, and we so respect and admire it, and that's why you're an honoree tonight. Thanks to all of you. I think we're going to have a reception now. Look forward to uh, meeting those of you I haven't been able to see uh, thus far. Actually, I think that's right. You're going to you're going to close the session. So, sorry for that. That's uh. Thanks, Bill. Um, my name is Brian Keen. And I'm uh, honored to be part of the Center for Environmental Policy, but also most honored to be a member of the American University of Alumni. And I've just recently, I've also served as the president of the Alumni Association. And I really think it's nights like tonight, which is why I came to AU, to actually meet very impressive people um, and actually to learn something, not only 40 times a day, but everything that <laughs> folks have talked about is fascinating. Uh, before, and <laughs> I'm very aware I'm standing between you all in the reception. But the, um, before we leave, I do want to pick up on what Barbara said. And Barbara had asked, what can each one of us do? And what, how can we each be part of the solution? And by the solution, she means, uh, by the problem, she means climate change. And I run an, an organization called Smart Power. And our job at Smart Power is to get regular people, as we say, with no, due respect, with no disrespect, people who don't go to meetings like this, but regular people to try to buy clean energy and to be energy efficient. We want to sell this stuff like it's Coca-Cola. We want people to be energy efficient like they buy McDonald's. And so really the question is, how can we all be part of the solution? So let's put it this way. It's true today, and this is true of everybody in this room, every single one of us today are living in a home that is more energy efficient than the homes we grew up in. 
And that is without a doubt true. And it's a credit to some of the work that, and most of the work that, or some of the work that a lot of people in this room have done. But at the same time, there is no doubt that every single one of us today are using more energy than we use in the home we grew up in. And that is just true. And that means, by the way, that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, every single one of us is using energy. It's as ubiquitous as air. And we need to start actually being respectful of that. We need to start becoming energy smart. You know, they changed the rules. When we were kids, to turn off the TV, you actually got up off the couch and you had to go and turn off the TV. Today, you flick it off the remote control, but guess what? It's actually still on, and it's still drawing power. When we were kids, the biggest energy drain in the house was the refrigerator. And at least that makes sense, right? It has to be on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Today, the biggest energy drain in the house is that TV that you thought you've turned off. It is still drawing power, and it's about $100 a year per TV when you think it's off. Now, add to the fact, by the way, that most American homes today have more flat screen TVs than they have children, and you are talking real power. This concept is concept of phantom load, and it's what we use to actually start getting people to think about power. Start understanding that, in fact, we're not just wasting power. We don't even know we're wasting power. We don't know that our TV is, off, is, is using power when we think it's off. We actually thought we did the right thing. I flicked it off with a remote, and yet it's still drawing power. My cell phone charges, you put them in the wall, and then you take your phone, you run off to work. That cell phone, that plug in the wall is still drawing power. And it's about $10 per year per charge, per, per plug. Now maybe $10 isn't that big a deal. But multiply that by the number of people in the house, plus your iPhone, your iPod, your iPhone, your, every, your i everything, and you're talking about real power. Today in the United States, today, there are 16 coal-fired power plants that are creating power today just to create phantom load in this country. Think about that. So if climate change really is the biggest issue, and we want to shut down coal-fired power plants, let's start with phantom load. The average American home today, 10% of its energy is just in phantom load. If we can cut that in half, it's a game changer. In fact, we were at Dan Estes' house a couple of years ago uh, doing a home energy audit, and that's where we started. We started with phantom load. Let's do the simple, quick, easy things that every single one of us can do in order to start being part of the solution. Take a walk down into your kitchen in the middle of the night, and it's like glowing, right? I mean, it really is. The average American kitchen has four clocks, and none of them are telling the right time, but four <laughs> clocks, and the room is lit up like a Christmas tree. Your microwave oven, the most energy your microwave oven uses is to power the clock. Like, how stupid is that? <laughs> Just to power the clock. Now, not even to cook food. By the way, you cook food in a microwave oven maybe, maybe an hour a year. Basically, it's a glorified popcorn maker. But that clock is on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. To the college students here, you all really are the solution. But in the process and at the same time, your demographic is actually the biggest wastes of energy in the country. And I know it's tough to say, but look at that college dorm room. Everything is plugged in, everything is charging, and it's just huge waste. And yet, your demographic believes climate change is real. You want to be part of the solution. So let's be part of the solution. Tonight when we go home, everybody be a part of that solution. Understand that fixing our energy problem, fixing our environmental problem, isn't just to the policymakers, but it starts with us. And if every single one of us does our little piece, then we really can get there. And then ultimately, we can change policies in the process. So with that, I would just like to say thank you, really, for all of our speakers tonight. Um, uh, congratulations to our award winners. And let's go to that reception. Thank you.